Okay, hi everybody, and I'm Akarlade, and welcome to another edition of Dungeon Master 101. So I think this is actually the most videos I've ever done in such a short space of time, which, you know, pat on the back. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm kind of delighted about that. So um, this week's video is going to be about traps and puzzles and kind of how I would use them in a dungeon and how you guys might use them yourselves. So just kind of a few tips that I've kind of picked up, um, mostly from my own experience, but also from kind of reading around and actually from the fourth edition DM's guidebook one and two, because they're like super, super helpful. And if you can afford only one, pick number two. Number two is really good. Um, but anyway, eh. Um, <laughs> Why am I so awkward? I don't know. Um, yeah. So um, I'm just going to hop right in. So I'm going to start off with um, traps and hazards. I'm going to kind of put them in together. So quick definition, a trap is something that somebody set in order to do physical harm or to otherwise detain um, another living creature. So it could be, you know, a rabbit snare or it could be I don't know, a tiger pit or a crossbow that is going to be set off when someone triggers it in some way. So it's something that somebody has put in place in order to do harm. And the second one, hazards, is just a natural occurring problem. Like, um, for example, a wall that is just, it's really old, so it's about to fall over. And if someone were to touch off it, it'd cave in. So that's, that's not something someone set up. Nobody sets up a wall that's going to come falling down. That's something that has just become a hazard. It's hazardous. So um, one is man-made. I'm using man here to mean any sentient being, being whatsoever. Beaming? Any sentient being whatsoever. And then hazard would be a naturally occurring um, sort of damaging thing. Okay. Yeah, naturally occurring. Um, so I just, and this week, instead of having my laptop behind me, uh, behind you actually, sorry, behind the camera, uh, which is not a camera, oh my god, I'm using all the wrong words today. So um, this week, instead of there being a laptop behind my tablet, I have a piece of paper. So if it looks like I'm ignoring you and looking to the side, it's because I kind of am, because I'm looking at the piece of paper so I don't forget anything. So. My first tip when it comes to um, traps or hazards is like with um, designing groups of monsters, you kind of have to keep things within the right type, within the right type group. It doesn't make sense for, for example, a Lord's Manor to have a floor that's going to fall in. It just, that kind of stuff is maintained, so it wouldn't fall in, so it wouldn't fit in in that kind of particular area. So I'm going to go through some examples of what you could do in kind of three, three different places, and then you can kind of use them as sort of genres within genres, subgenres. I'm going to say. So the first one would be ancient runes. Um, this could also be you know like sea caves, whatever. Um, something that's not really inhabited anymore or was never inhabited. So this would be kind of hazard central, but it might have kind of remaining vestiges of when it was inhabited by any kind of sentient being or even animals, things like that. So any kind of traps that may have been set. Um, the second one is going to be a bandit hideout. That's going to be kind of poor people or people without um, a lot of resources, people that would be using things that they would be making by hand, etc, etc. And then the third one will be the Lord's Manor, which is someone who has money to burn. Um, so their equipment would be much better. They'd probably use more magical things instead of mundane things because they could afford the enchantments, things like that. So that's kind of the three um, kind of topic headings, my subgenres, as it were, um, as regards, I'm going to loosely call them dungeons but um, basically areas that your players can explore. So what would fit in an ancient rune? And as I said, that's mostly going to be hazards. So things like unsteady walls that, you know, if someone were to strike them or brush up against them, they might come tumbling down, um, floors caving in. And even if you have like ceiling joists that are rotted and, you know, 
just a bit of a creak, somebody steps on it, it all comes in. Um, and do as well remember if you're if one party member goes upstairs while everyone is downstairs, if that floor goes down, it's going on top of your other players. So that can cause even more problems, etc. etc. So that can be really, really interesting. But as I say, if it's an ancient ruin, you might have kind of latent, for want of a better term, like remaining um, traps and things like that that were laid by people who once lived there. So if it was once a lord's man or something like that, they could maybe have some kind of magical trap that's left behind that the magic hasn't decayed 100% yet. So it might not work to the full value, but it might just, you know, do a little bit of damage or just, just give them something to think about. Um, also, do bear in mind, if you are going to have traps in an ancient castle, if they've been there forever, they're going to have rotted or they may have been set off by wild animals going through or wandering goblins or whatever. And there's no one there to reset the traps. So if, you know, if it's been 60 years since the last people have gone inside, then maybe there might be a couple of traps still working, still operable, but more than likely everything has already been set off and nothing has been reset because the people that originally set it there are gone. As well as that, you need to think of things like if you have um, a crossbow that is set to shoot somebody once they step on a pressure plate, that string will have gone. That string will have decayed and broken. So that that crossbow isn't going to fire anything. So what you could do, which would be very interesting actually to build up a little bit of suspense, is have them step on a plate. Have your character step on a plate. Tell them you notice that the floor sinks in the pressure plate. Get them to roll if you want to, if you want to increase the, oh God, what's going to happen? And then just have a couple of crossbow bolts just slip out of the wall. They didn't get fired. They just kind of fell out because whatever string that was supposed to fire them has long since decayed into dust because um, these things were rope or sinew um, and they, they don't last that much. They don't last 200 years. They just don't. Um, so that's kind of something to think about there. Um, when it comes to bandit hideouts, well, you'd be kind of looking at much more kind of MacGyver-esque handmade things. So what's really good, actually, if any of you have played Skyrim, the Skyrim bandit traps are actually really, really good because they have rocks, they have logs, they might have, um an elephant or woolly mammoth skull that they can rig up with ropes that when somebody trips either a tripwire or a pressure plate or something like that it's going to come in and either do a bit of damage or alternatively make a bit of noise so that the bandits will know that they're there that there's an intruder who didn't know to step around this particular rock or to do a little hop at this particular point to get over a tripwire and um so that's kind of what you'd be looking at. So, you know, rocks that'll fall, um, logs that will swing down and knock people over, you know, any kind of elephant-esque skull with tusks that can knock into people. They're not going to do huge amounts of damage, um, but they'll still be reasonably effective and they'll probably knock players prone. Um, and that's kind of the main thing. It's to slow people down. That's usually what that kind of thing would do. If you could kill someone outright, uh, maybe, but it's not going to kill all the players unless they're like level one or two. They're all in armor. They're all going to have reasonable enough reflex. Um, so a lot of people will be able to jump out of the way. And typically the ones with less armor are the ones with better reflex. Um, if you think along the lines of rogues, etc. Whereas a paladin who's armed to the gills in, in plate armor they might get thrown a couple of feet, but they're not going to end up with more than maybe a headache from the ringing clang from being hit in the back with a with a log. It's not going to be a huge amount of damage, but it gives the bandits time to get themselves ready and to rush whoever is breaking in. And that would be kind of more the purpose they'd be looking for as well. Um, you might want to look into hunting traps. If you research different hunting traps, because realistically 
that's more what's going to be in a bandit's expertise for getting food and things like that. They'll know about snares for rabbits. Or even if you look up bird traps, they're lethal. They are lethal. Um, they're like springing like logs full of spikes that'll, oh, they're awful. They're really, really scary, but really, really effective and very quick. So they would do a huge amount of damage. So look into that kind of thing. Um, one thing I noticed in Skyrim as well, they have like hanging ropes covered in bones so that if you walk past them, they make noise. And while that works up to a point, bones do make a little bit of noise when they're dried out. They can be quite loud, but the, the sound doesn't travel very well. But think about what kinds of things bandits might come across, whether on people that they attack in the streets or whether it's or on, the, um, on the roads rather, sorry or whether it's stuff that they have themselves. Think about that. What would they have that they'd be able to make noise? What if they had like a broken pot? Like if, it, if they'd worn a hole in the bottom of a pot? Well, it's still going to make noise. It's still essentially a metal drum. So if you have that hanging and a bunch of sticks and stones hanging, as soon as someone knocks into that, it's going to be crash, bang, wallop, really loud, really sonorous, really distinctive. You know, something like bones clacking together, that could be branches from a tree outside. It can be mistaken. Whereas pots and pans whacking off each other, or even old cutlery, or, you know, any bits of metal and wood and rock banging off each other, it's very difficult to mistake that. And that would be more what um, a clever bandit would do. So try to think MacGyver stuff. If you were sitting in essentially a half rotten building and you only had some random items what could you make to have like a burglar alarm system what could you make that would delay or otherwise harm an intruder that's the kind of thing you need to be thinking about um and of course once you start thinking like that you can always come up with more and more ideas but do keep it as simple as possible simple and effective and doesn't waste too much in the way of resources. So that's the kind of thing you'd be looking at for bandits. So think Skyrim, keep it simple, keep it basic. Um, yeah, so that gets us to the Lord's Manor. And the Lord's Manor, you're gonna have things like magical wards. So if they recognize somebody that shouldn't be there, they'll go off and do whatever it is that they're gonna do. So you can have like, flame ruins, ice ruins, things like that. You know, something that just starts shrieking. Think um, like the books in the forbidden section in Harry Potter when they open them up and they're not supposed to be there. The book starts scream and screaming and will not stop. So have something similar to that because that's why you would want this kind of protection in your home is to know, not just to kill people in your house, but to know that something has happened and action needs to be taken. Um, similarly, you could have even something as simple as a golem posed as a statue or rather a statue that is also a golem. And if they recognize someone who is not recognize someone who's not supposed to be there, if they realize that someone is not supposed to be there, they can spring forward and attack. Again, think Harry Potter when McGonagall sends all the statues to defend Hogwarts um, to circumvent that even. If your players get wind that there's golems in the house, they could steal outfits from, you know, serving staff or from the Lord themselves, dress up as them and hope and try to sneak their way past, essentially. Um, and that kind of makes things really, really interesting. And that can make things really challenging because how do you fight a golem without everyone knowing? That's the question. Um, so that sets things to be really, really interesting. And as well, something that kind of came to me earlier when I was brainstorming for this video. What if they enchanted like wall hangings and tapestries? And so when someone who's not supposed to be in a particular area walks past, the tapestry will come down from the wall, wrap about the person's face and choke them until they're dead. That's a scary thought. And then it kind of can be that it you need magic to deactivate the magic. 
you need a particular set of words, you need a particular ritual to be done before passing past, passing past, before walking past the tapestry, before I'm um, like even entering the same room so that the tapestry recognizes that, oh, you know what to do to get through this room. Therefore, you're supposed to be here because only the people who are supposed to be in this room know how to pass through safely. And then you can have it even that if you, like if it was a higher level kind of party, if you were to cut or rip or tear the, um, the tapestry or whatever, the wall hanging in half, what if both of them could then strangle people and then you have two people being attacked? Think like Fantasia, the more you cut it up, the more it can harm you kind of thing. Like even when it's down to little fibres, you could inhale some and it could strangle you from the inside. That's creepy. That's really, really creepy. And the, the solution could very simply be kill it with fire. Or it could be a magical deactivation. Or perhaps it's just a case of prevention is better than cure and you could be punishing your players for not doing the research before jumping into the job. Who knows? Who knows? It's kind of up to you how you want to use these. These are very much, you'd have to make up your own rules for them. My advice for doing that would be to look through the DM's guidebooks and find traps on the level that your players are on or whatever level you want the trap to be at. And then just alter the description. Keep the same damage. You know, something that's similar enough. So asphyxiation is still a violent and awful thing. So if you had something like, a, I don't know, magical warding on a door, take that same damage, take the same damage die and just change perhaps what defense you need. So perhaps you need fortitude instead of reflex because you can't jump away from a tapestry falling. It's too large to do that. It's too big, you're only in a corridor or something. So fortitude, so that you can stay conscious longer or something like that. Perhaps you need to make endurance rolls in order to maintain your consciousness, in order to deal without oxygen for a long period of time, in order to continue fighting because maybe the tapestry doesn't let go after someone falls unconscious. And then, of course, you can make it so that every round they lose a d6 or a d10 um, of damage or whatever it is. You know, you can make it a gradual kind of thing, like when you're swimming in certain video games, your health bar just goes until you're dead. So um, I don't know. You can kind of decide where you're at or where your players are at and what would be fair and that kind of thing. Or you can make it completely unfair and make it like murder city if you really want to. Again, it's sort of DM's prerogative. So that will be up to you, though. If you have any specific questions about that, by all means, let me know and I'll do my best to answer those. So now that's sort of what you could do. Now, sometimes people, or at least the questions that I get, are usually about the where should you put a trap? or how many should you put in a particular dungeon to crawl? And I'm saying dungeon as in area that your players have to explore or move through or whatever. So I would say that where actually answers the question of how many, because you do need to limit how many you put in, because if there's a trap in every room, your players will go in really cautious, really slowly, nothing will be trusted, nothing will be taken for granted, everything will be checked. And then there's no sense of accomplishment for you or them because the entire building has now just slowed to a snail's pace and it becomes very boring and very predictable. And the point of traps is not to be predictable. They're traps, you're not supposed to expect them. And if there's one in every room and only one in every room, and your players will go, okay, where's the trap? They'll check all the doors, they'll check all the windows, they'll check all the random objects that you have strewn about, they'll check the floors, they'll check the ceilings, they'll check everything. And when they've found that one trap in the room, they'll go, okay, this room's clear. And then they'll search it properly. And then they'll move on to the next room. Okay, where's the trap? Check the floors, check the ceiling, check all the items and everything else. And it suddenly becomes just this training exercise. 
instead of something that's very real and immediate and exciting. It loses completely in translation if you don't have them, just a gentle sprinkling on top. But again, the where kind of answers the how many question. So when it comes to something like bandits, if the, if the bandit hideout is going to be booby trapped, the traps are going to be at every entrance. So if there's only two entrances, then there'll only be two traps. Very simple. Then there may be, if they have like um, a loot room sort of situation, if they have an area that they dump all their stuff, that they've stolen in there in order to be divided up later that would be trapped and then perhaps perhaps a fourth trap heading in towards the sleeping quarters in case they don't hear someone coming in the entrance way they'll wake up if they'll need one before the sleeping quarters to wake them up to have them ready and prepared now i'm not talking right outside the sleeping quarters i'm talking maybe a 30 second walk away. Time enough for the bandits to jump out of bed, grab a weapon and rush to the people to bottleneck whoever's in the corridor. Um, they're not going to have it right in the doorway because they'll wake up just in time to die. So placement there is quite important. And also if it's placed in a strain, if a trap is placed in some random corridor or in the middle of a room, for no reason other than you wanted to put one there. Players are going to ask, what were they protecting? Because that's what traps are for. They're for protecting. Like in the case of a dungeon, they're for protecting things. They're for protecting the people that live in the dungeon, in the hideout, in the manor, in the whatever it is. They're for protecting people. They're not for, you know, just for the fun of us. Because that makes the middle of that room completely unusable for the rest of their lives because maybe no one will ever break in. So it doesn't make any sense to trap that unless there's something important underneath, above or nearby. So think very carefully before you place anything, basically. Um, however, hazards can be liberally thrown everywhere, pretty much, once it makes sense for something to be collapsing or falling apart in some way, shape or form, that's fine. That makes perfect sense. If the middle of a castle room is going to fall down, that's fine. That makes sense. If it's a ruin, that's fine. If it's a castle that's currently in use, that doesn't make any sense. Because surely it would have fallen in by now, or surely it would be maintained. So it doesn't make any sense. And if it doesn't make any sense, your players are going to notice. And they're going to ask, like, what, what are they doing? Like, why is that there? Or anything like that. And that is a question you don't really want your players asking unless you have a really good reason. And if you're really good reason, then yay, they ask the right question and you can give them the really fun answer. Um, but typically having a room trapped in the middle of it for no reason, it's very difficult to explain yourself out of that one. Then Lord's Manor, they might have more or they might have less or fewer, sorry. Um, it kind of depends on the Lord, if they're a very prominent sort of figure or if they're involved in some kind of controversy or in an unpopular political situation or something like that, then yes, they'd have more in the way of traps and things set out. They'd have more security basically because they have a better reason to fear for their lives. If they're a lesser Lord and just some Lord's son that happens to be living in the summer manor for now, they'd be less in the way of security because there's no reason to believe that his life would be in danger. There would of course be kind of your token gesture at security, but it wouldn't be as bad for your players as it would be if they were going after, for example, a baron that's in, that's in charge of huge tracts of land and whose lineage is a little bit muddy. So his, um, his whole title and everything, the whole inheritance behind that might be a bit contentious about it. So they might have to watch that a little bit more carefully. Um, so where would they have traps and hazards? Well, not hazards, they, the, the manor would be too well looked after. Um, so it would be, again, at entrances to let people know that, you know, if burglars are coming in. Uh, so main entrances in the kitchens, perhaps, if there's a fear that the Lord or any of his household 
would be poisoned. So only certified staff are allowed in certain rooms. So the kitchen might be um, trapped. Um, if the family sleep on a particular corridor or off a particular wing, that would also be trapped to stop un unqualified staff from entering. So of course the, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Of course the batman and the uh, valets would be allowed to go through. But, and the scullery, and like the maids and things would be allowed in to do whatever duties they need, but the, the cook wouldn't because there's no reason for the cook to go into their sleeping quarters. There's no reason for the stable boys to be going into the sleeping quarters. There's no reason for them to be there. They're not allowed in there. The traps will go off and kill them if they try. Very simple, very, very scary sounding, but if someone's paranoid enough and have enough money, they'll be able to do that. Um, another place they could do that, if they have a treasury or some other jewel room, they could sort that out as well. They could have that trapped to stop people from entering. But regardless of what they have in their house or anything like that, you have to kind of measure that up to how paranoid they are or how real the threat to their life would be. Now, having a treasury trapped, that just makes sense. That's just financial. That's business. That's fair enough because, you know, a stable boy doesn't get paid very much and they have to work really hard. And if they have dreams of entering a college or moving away to the city and making themselves well-known or famous or finding their destiny, they may be very tempted by a room full of sparkling jewellery. So trapping that makes a lot of sense. But um, trapping kitchens and uh, sleeping quarters, that's a little bit more paranoid. So I guess that kind of depends on the personality of the Lord that you want to portray. Um, so again, that will depend on your NPC um, in that situation. Um, but my main kind of thing with placement there has to be a good reason because no one's going to go to that effort and to that risk without a good motivation. So if there's no real reason to believe that someone's going to poison you, there's no point in trapping your kitchen because it just takes forever because you're going to have to, one, pay some kind of sorcerer to come in to trap your, the doors into the kitchen and there'll be, of course, the service entrance outside coming in and then there'll be the the door going into the rest of the house and perhaps even the servant's staircase going up to their rooms and that will all have to be trapped. Then you have to get in all the stuff that's allowed to go in and have the sorcerer set the trap so that they can pass through without getting harmed and set the trap so that the entire household can go into the kitchens without being harmed and then you probably have to test it to make sure that it works and everything else and it'll be really scary and it'll really really cost a lot of money and unless you have a really good reason to spend that kind of money time and effort it's just not going to happen nobody would do that unless they were mental and again that's npc personality you need to be very sure of what they want and what they believe and excuse the shouting in the background my dog is apparently misbehaving um <laughs> so now the next question is just sort of me trying to give you the fullest amount of information I can um, or at least the fullest amount of advice as I can give at this point and um, more specific questions I can give more specific answers but this is just sort of a talk about traps and puzzles so it's um, a little bit more difficult so why would we as DMs put in traps or hazards into a place and the first answer that I could come up with to that is that there's a sort of a pressure or an expectation that there would be. It's not really seen as a proper dungeon crawl unless traps start going off and they need the rogue to come in and sort them out and do their thievery skill checks um, to deactivate them or the wizards to sense the magic before it gets set off. And it's just, it's really sort of an expectation. It seems sort of incomplete without them. at least one or two. Um, so that would be the first thing. So it's kind of, it's sort of important to get that full, fully rounded experience within a session or two worth of dungeon crawling is to get in a couple of really good traps. And if you set them just right and 
maybe one or two players notice but the rest don't and it gets set on them then you have this wonderful shock moment because generally you'll find players will be you know rolling perception the whole time and they'll hear the orcs grumbling in the next room so they'll go okay there's guys nearby and they'll be ready so there's no surprise round or they'll sneak in really stealthily and have a surprise round of their own but traps are your opportunity to catch them unawares to catch them with their pants down basically and if you just turn to a player and say what's your reflex or even if you have a reference sheet, which I do recommend to have a reference sheet of all of your characters' um, stats on it. Just roll a dice. Bronn. Bronn has fallen down a massive hole and takes that much damage because there's spikes at the bottom and he's managed to get his arm impaled on one of them. Fortunately, he's fallen down between them, so the damage isn't that bad. And Bronn is sitting there going, that's half my health. Oh my god. And everyone else is like, Bronn, no! And it's this big, wasn't expecting that. Oh my god, oh my god, you guys. And then it's, how do we how do we get Bronn out of the hole? How do we get Bronn out of the hole? Does anyone have any rope? No, we used it the last, we used it, we used it a little while ago. Did nobody think to buy a new rope? Nobody thought to buy a new rope. What are we going to do? And it becomes this big thing. And then you turn to the paladin and say, do you think you're strong enough to hold me up by the ankles so that I can grab Bronn's hand? Could you pull us all up if we did that? And Pan's sitting there going like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I can try. The bard's not going to be any help. And the bard's sitting there like, I can, I can play a song. Or you can dangle me. Maybe I'm lighter. And it takes this big, like, how do we solve a problem? How do we fix this? We weren't expecting that. Oh my God. And it becomes this big, like, holy shit, Bronn fell down a hole. And now he's really hurt and his arms impaled in a massive spike. And, you know, if you can describe it in that way, it can be a really lively sort of experience. Or you can just make it a... Bron falls down a hole, he's taken 14 damage. How are you going to get him out? It's about 20 foot, it's about 20 foot deep. Then it's just a... Does anyone have a rope? No. Okay. Um... I guess you could dangle me by my ankles. Yeah, we can try that. And then it's very simple. But if you can dramatize it and have it as a a really detailed and interesting sort of experience, please think of any novels, movies, anything like that that I was talking about um, last week for NPCs. Think about the drama that they can have when it comes to traps being sprung on main characters. Like... Everyone remembers Indiana Jones running away from that giant boulder. How would you get your players to be that like, oh my God, how would you get that drama into your game? And I think that's something you need to think about. And I think that's something I need to think about. It's something I'm forever trying to work on and make better because it's so easy to just stick to the stats. But the story can really benefit from some really good and intense DM description. Um, and I've kind of derailed myself there. Um, so why are we putting these in? And actually that's kind of adding this extra answer, which is it adds all kinds of flavor, all kinds of flavor. Because going into a hideout and slaying goblins is the most vanilla thing in the world. It's so, cliched at this point it's so typically D, &D so typically early party D, D as well going in and killing a bunch of goblins and oh no they have a bugbear and it's this it's this big thing that everyone does and it's sort of a rite of passage almost but if it's just goblins in a network of caves like everyone's done it before everybody's done it before that's really boring but if you have goblins that are, like, a couple of them are really mechanically minded. And they've made all kinds of really weird traps. And try to channel maybe the space orcs out of Warhammer 40k. Like, they have really made really awful, weird machines that do really unexpected things. Suddenly, 
this clan of goblins isn't just, oh, those are the goblins out by Foxford. They were the Blood Nut clan. And they will be remembered because of all of the crazy crap that they had lying around. The stuff that looked like piles of junk and then wound up hurling cow feces all over the place. Or, like, you never know. Like, you can come up with whatever you want. It can be as ridiculous or as horrifying as you can think of. Or it can be ridiculously horrifying or horrifically ridiculous. You can do whatever you really want. But try to put in a little personality with it because honestly a good trap in the right place can make or break a dungeon crawl it can make it the most like these guys are mental do you really want to be here <laughs> like oh my god like creeping through the dungeon like uh, not checking everything because okay the last couple of rooms have been clear but oh, there's probably one coming it's like that moment just before a jump scare in a horror movie where they're sitting there going like oh my god what's gonna happen or it's like the room just filled with bees why is the room full of bees oh no and then you know you have someone roll nature those aren't just bees those are elysian killer bees and everyone goes no what does that mean that's everyone's speed. Okay, you got to make a run for it because these bees are out for blood. They are pissed. And it becomes this... Oh my God, do you remember the bee cave? Oh, don't even talk to me about the bee cave. I still haven't gotten over the bee cave. No, does someone just say bees? <laughs> PTSD trigger kind of thing. It can become this really big thing. Something for you to talk about for years. And that can be really important to have those moments as a party because it bonds everybody together and it's really, really good. And that also comes into the last reason that I would put in traps and hazards, and that is it keeps players on their toes. It really does. It stops players from going, okay, there's no one in this room, that's fine, and going through. It just adds that little bit of doubt, that little bit of pressure, just, just to keep them, okay, to keep them engaged and paying attention. So it's not just, I'm just going to make my character walk over into that corner it's, I'm going to roll perception. Do I see anything? No. Okay, then I'm going to sidle over to the corner, but I'm going to go around along the wall just in case. It's going to be just something to keep player engagement up, which is just really important when it comes to dungeon crawls, because unfortunately some characters really are built for non-combat encounters. They're really built for those. And like I'm really guilty of that. I am always building my characters for non-combat because I really like the story element. But with traps and things, you can really add a lot of flavor and that can bring the story in. So I'm thinking that this video is getting really long. So I might just have to do a part two um, when it comes to like puzzles and things, because this has gone on for ages. I think I have like 40 minutes of footage now. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to call it here guys because puzzles is gonna take me a bit as well because I quite like doing puzzles. I'm hoping that you guys will be interested in hearing about how I would deal with puzzles um, as kind of a part two to this. Um, it will probably be a shorter video, I'm not sure, but Hopefully that will be soon. I know I have a bit of downtime in the middle of this coming week. So hopefully that will um, allow me to do even just a short little video about puzzles. Um, next weekend is my cousin's wedding. So I won't be able to make a video then. But hopefully the week after I will have something up for you guys. Um, I still haven't settled on a day to make this a weekly thing or whether this is going to be just a you know a continuation of the I'll do it whenever I have time to but I'm hoping to have this on kind of like a regular schedule and whatever else and hopefully hopefully I will be able to have this um opening sequence thingy sorted out I still have no idea what I want in it so if anybody has suggestions for that or other videos stick them down if anyone has any questions about traps or hazards or even puzzles stick them down in the comments um because honestly it makes my day every time i get one um and i will be responding to any questions that you guys have 
So I've been Akralade. Hopefully this video has been at least entertaining, if not helpful. And you guys have been awesome. And I should hopefully uh, have a video up in a few days. If not, then probably like two weeks. So until then.